it's, it's a great pleasure and a deep honor for me uh, today to talk in such a prestigious place, the Karolinska Institute, on the eve of receiving the Sherberg Prize together with my colleagues, Ugdete and Chen Zhu. And uh, let me first sincerely thank the Sherberg Foundation and the Prize Committee for this award and their great funding support to our ongoing research. So in this presentation, I'll go through, do I have to do something? Or? Do. Okay. So um, in this presentation, I'll go through this fascinating story that took us from liver cancer to acute promyelocytic leukemia and then to its tight link with SUMO, an intriguing type of post-translational modification. So I'll focus on the main works that led to the discoveries of the molecular and cellular defects responsible for uh, acute promyelocytic leukemia, uh, APL, that not only provided a basis for the disease, but also for its uh, so efficient treatment. And then I'll move to some recent findings we just got in the lab. So the first chapter will take us from hepatitis B virus to the discovery of the retinic acid receptors. In fact, when I joined the, the lab of Pierre Thiolet at the Pasteur Institute in Paris as a PhD student, my project aim at clarifying the molecular role of HBV in the development of liver cancer. Indeed, um, epidemiological studies had unequivocally demonstrated an etiological role for HBV in the development of hepatocarcinoma that remains the second most mortal cancer in the world with more than 780,000 new cases each year. And despite the large vaccination program, HBV still accounts for 55% of all hepatocarcinoma cases. And notably, there is a strict correlation between the geographical distribution of the chronic HBV carriers as detected by the presence of the HBS antigen in the blood and the incidence of hepatocarcinoma. Indeed, the two regions in the world, that is Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, with the highest prevalence of HBS antigen, with more than 15% of chronic HBV carriers, are also the two regions in which hepatocarcinoma is one of the most common cancer, accounting for 15% of all cancer cases. So when I started my PhD, Christian Brechot in the lab had just shown that HBV can integrate, can, can insert its genome into the genome of the liver cancer cells. So to test the hypothesis, that uh, doing so, HBV could uh, alter the expression of neighboring human genes, similarly to oncogenic retroviruses. I cloned such an HBV, sorry, I did what I should not. Um, I, I cloned such an HBV integration from a liver cancer, this little faint band here, and could show that in this patient, indeed, HBV had integrated into a cellular gene, which first was new, and second, which shared striking similarities with gene encoding nuclear hormone receptors. So um, this finding not only demonstrated or provided the first demonstration that HBV can play a direct role in liver cancer by insertional mutagenesis, a mechanism that has been extended after that to many other patients harboring HPV integration in a variety of human genes, but it also led to the fortuitous discovery of a novel nuclear receptor with this burning question, what what is gene X, sorry, what is the ligand for this uh, novel nuclear receptor? 
And um, at that time, having just got a permanent position at INSERM and with this goal in mind, I was offered the chance to develop my own young team within the lab. And uh, this is the time when Uc joined me uh, for his PhD thesis, and this has been the beginning of uh, seven or eight years, of five years, of intense and, uh, and um, fruitful work together. So we first cloned the entire gene X, and later on in collaboration with Pierre Chambon, we could show that the protein product of this gene was nothing else than the receptor for retinoic acid, the active derivative of vitamin A, which we named retinoic acid receptor beta. So why beta? Because using as a probe this little sequence here at the HPV integration site that we had published earlier, Ron Evans and Pierre Chambon identified another retinoic acid receptor which they named alpha. So in this patient, HPV had integrated into the retinoic acid receptor beta gene, leading to, sorry, leading to the expression of a fusion HBV or a beta protein showing oncogenic properties. Indeed, when expressed in animals, we could show later on that this fusion HBV or AR beta leads to the development of liver cancer. So um, the finding of an HBV integration within the retinoic acid receptor beta gene in a liver cancer provided us with the first evidence that altered retinoid receptors might be involved in other types of human cancers. And because we had just cloned this retinoic acid receptor beta gene, we've been approached by Laurent de Gauss in Paris to start a collaboration on acute promalocytic leukemia. So this type of leukemia, originally described by a Swedish clinician, Leif Illestadt, as the most malignant form of acute leukemia, comprises nearly 10% of acute myeloid leukemias in adults, and it's characterized by a translocation between chromosome 15 and 17, originally described by Janet Raleigh, and a striking sensitivity to retinic acid in vitro and in vivo. Indeed, Wang Zhenyi in Shanghai and Laurent de Gauss in Paris had shown that retinoic acid treatment of APR patients in combination with chemotherapy actually cured long to, led to long-term survival in 75% of the patients. And the principle of this so-called differentiation therapy is to force the blockage of differentiation of the leukemic promalocytes into fully mature and functional granulocytes. So at the time these data have been published some 30 years ago, they raised some eyebrows. It was a totally new concept in anti-cancer therapy. The point was not to kill the malignant cell as conventional therapy does, but to put it back on its proper path to circumvent this blockage of differentiation. So we cloned this 1517 translocation that led to the identification of the molecular defect responsible for this form of leukemia. Indeed, we found that in these patients, the translocation fuses a new gene, which we have named PML for promalocyte on chromosome 15, to the retinoic acid receptor alpha gene on chromosome 17, leading to the expression of a chimeric PML or our oncoprotein. And um, at that point, we were facing two questions. First, how does PML oil block terminal differentiation of the promalocytes leading to the leukemia? And second, how does retinoic acid release this blockage of uh, differentiation uh, uh, leading to clinical cure? 
and uh, similar data were reported by uh, Ellen Salomon. So, before going on on that, I'd just like to briefly remind you how these receptors work. So, retinoic acid receptors, which belong to the large families of nuclear hormone receptors, which also include the steroid and the thyroid hormone receptors, function as ligand-inducible transcription factors. So first, in the absence of retinoic acid, the receptor represses transcription through binding to a series of co-repressors which themselves interact with histone deacetylase that compact chromatin, thus preventing transcription. And upon ligand binding, the receptor shifts from a repressor to an activator of transcription by the release of this repressor complex and subsequent recruitment of this activator complex with histone acetylase activity, thus allowing chromatin opening and efficient transcription of the full retinoic acid transcriptional program responsible for terminal differentiation. So, we had um, identified a, a highly specific retinoic acid responsive element, a short motif of six nucleotides in the DNA to which the receptor binds, thus providing a tool to study the transcriptional properties of PML oil when compared to the wild-type receptor. And we found that at physiological concentration of retinoic acid due to the PML moiety, PML oil still behaves as a repressor of transcription, still binds this co-repressor complex, so that now you need high therapeutic doses of retinoic acid to convert PML oil from a repressor to an activator of transcription and an activator of terminal differentiation. So we then moved to the variant PLZF, uh, to the variant 1117 translocation that accounts for 2% of all APL patients and give rise to the PLZF oil oncoprotein. So in contrast to the PML oil patients, the PLZF oil patients are resistant to retinic acid treatment. As, <coughs> as are the, the cells uh, derived from these patients in vitro, and the course of the disease is characterized by rapid death. So in collaboration with Martin Privalski, we could show that uh, PLZF oil behaves differently from PML oil, and this is due to the contribution of the PLZF moiety in that it shows a very high affinity for this repressor complex due to the fact that PLZF also associate with this repressor complex. <laughs> so that now even high therapeutic doses of retinoic acid are unable to uh, dislodge, to displace this repressor complex from chromatin thus preventing activation of retinoic acid target genes and blocking terminal differentiation and resistance to retinoic acid treatment. So to schematize differential affinity for this repressor complex contributes to the differential response to retinoic acid of the wild-type receptor and of the two fusion PML oil and PLZF oil oncoproteins thus providing one of the bases for the disease and its ability to respond to retinoic acid treatment. And similar data were then reported by several other groups. Now, in mouse models, things might be a bit more complex, depending on the models used, and Hugues will certainly talk about that in his presentation. <coughs> so, if it is relatively easy to figure out how PML oil interferes with the uh, retinoic pathway. What about the PML pathway? And I'd like now to move to another aspect of APL pathogenesis, which is the discovery of 
a cellular defect now associated with this type of leukemia. So as a first step to elucidate the function of the native PML protein, we simply analyzed its intracellular localization. And we found that PML concentrates within discrete subnuclear structures, which we called the PML nuclear bodies, the number of which varies from 5 to 20 per nucleus, depending on the cell type. And another major component of these structures is the SP100 protein, and here is the overlay. By electron microscopy, these structures appear as roughly spherical particles that often display donut-like morphology. So these PML nuclear bodies, which are present in every single cell in our organism, are distinct from active sites of transcription, replication, or pre-mRNA processing. And the fact is that the function of these structures still remains largely unknown. But when we then looked at the leukemic APL cells, surprisingly, we found that the expression of the PML or AR oncoprotein leads to the complete disruption of the PML nuclear bodies into hundreds of microparticulate structures when compared to the intact bodies as present in non-APL cells. And strikingly, retinic acid treatment induced the complete restoration of intact nuclear bodies correlating with cell differentiation in vitro and with clinical cure of the patients. So these findings that involved uh, for the first time the disruption of a nuclear organelle in a human cancer led us to propose that the therapeutic effect of retinic acid in APL might also be related to uh, restore a normal subnuclear organization to correct this cellular defect. And similar data were reported by the lab of Ron Evans and then de Té, who had just uh, uh, set up his own lab at the Hôpital Saint-Louis. So since the integrity of these PML nuclear bodies is compromised in a human leukemia, uh, we became interested in studying the signals that may regulate the dynamic of these structures. And for that, we focused on the effect of arsenic trioxide, a compound used in Chinese traditional medicine that had been shown by a group in Harbin and the lab of Chen Zhu in Shanghai to be highly efficient at inducing remissions in both retinoic acid uh, sensitive and relapsed APL patients. And the fact is that several clinical trials first conducted by Chen Zhu have now clearly shown that combining retinoic acid and arsenic, even in the absence of any chemotherapy, actually cures more than 90% of all APL patients and thus represents the frontline treatment uh, uh, for APL in many countries. So while studying the mechanism of action of arsenic in APL, Stefan Müller, a former postdoc in the lab, made the following observation. He observed that similar to what we had shown for retinoic acid, arsenic induces the restoration of intact PML nuclear bodies, but in this case, it's an extremely rapid phenomenon as it takes only two, three hours, when retinoic acid needs at least three days to produce the same effect. So both retinoic acid and arsenic are able to correct the cellular defect associated with this type of leukemia. And Stefan could clarify the mechanism underlying this effect. He found that Similar to what happens for retinoic acid, which induces the degradation of the PML or aronchoprotein, as originally shown by Nawes group, arsenic similarly induces the degradation of the PML or aronchoprotein in APL cells, but much more rapidly and efficiently than retinoic acid does. And to make a long story short, what Stefan discovered is that arsenic 
induces a shift of PML with the appearance of this high molecular weight PML species, and that this is due to the covalent attachment to PML of a very small protein called SUMO, and that the polysumulation, the polymodification of the PML moiety within PML oil is associated with PML oil degradation. So um, a ubiquitin E3 ligase responsible for this simulation coupled ubiquitination process has been identified by a series of labs as a sumo-targeted ubiquitin ligase, and notably by Tony Hunter, the last year recipient of the Sherberg Prize. And then this has been extended to PML and PML oil, notably by UC. So um, the polysumo chains induced by uh, arsenic are recognized by this ubiquitin E3 ligase RNF4, which in turn triggers polyubiquitination and degradation of the substrate. So if other sumo substrates undergo this process, and Nadine Martin in the lab identified POP1 as a second substrate undergoing this process, I must say that the effect of arsenic at inducing polysumulation is unique to PML and remains really intriguing. And I think that Chen Zhu and Hugues will uh, talk about that uh, in their presentation. So, in summary, both retinoic acid and arsenic, by somewhat common and distinct mechanisms, Retinoic acid, by targeting, by binding its receptor moiety to restore a normal retinoic acid transcriptional program, ultimately leading to terminal differentiation, arsenic now, by targeting the PML moiety, by inducing its polysumulation, which triggers PML oil degradation, ultimately leading to cell death, or cell proliferation arrest, the two compounds thus represent two different weapons, weapons to specifically target the PML or your oncoprotein, and thus represent a prime example of an oncogene targeted therapy with such a high level of cure. But if this scheme summarizes the main mechanism of action of retinoic acid and arsenic in eradication of APL, several questions remain to be addressed to precisely dissect the respective contribution of the molecular and cellular pathways involved, and notably the role of the restoration of the PML nuclear bodies, which is induced by the two compounds, or the contribution of terminal differentiation, which is also induced, at least in part, by arsenic, which can notably trigger the life-threatening differentiation syndrome, like retinoic acid, or the importance of retinoic acid-induced degradation of PML oil. And this is particularly pertinent given that the variant PLZF or oncoprotein is equally well degraded by retinic acid, although the patients are resistant to the treatment. And in this case, it was proposed the possible contribution of the reciprocal product of the 1117 translocation, but this product is only present in a minor fraction of these patients. So we are quite confident that future studies will continue to generate exciting developments in the field of APL, which remains um, a, um, a most uh, a paradigmatic model for treatment targeted to a molecular defect. So I'd like now to jump ahead several years and share with you our most recent work on SUMO, uh, and that unraveled a novel role for this modification with direct relevance to cancer, and we come now to unpublished results. So SUMO, which stands 
for small ubiquitin like modifier is a very small protein that uh, becomes covalently attached on its substrate after an enzymatic cascade, and it can either remain alone or it can form long chains, and then SUMO can be removed in a reversible process. So uh, if we have identified a PML as the second substrate for SUMO, now nearly 7,000 different proteins have been shown to be modified by SUMO, including the main tumor suppressors and oncoproteins. And although acute promyelocytic leukemia represents the most striking example linking SUMO to cancer, um, SUMO was now found to be involved in every tumorigenic process and to be hyperactivated in the vast majority of human cancers. And this is an illustration in the column showing this global SUMO pattern in the tumor and the adjacent non-tumor spot. So because change in cell identity and cell fate underlies every tumorigenic process, a change dictated by a dramatic shift in the transcriptional program, and because we could show in these two uh, studies that SUMO acting on chromatin is a key regulator of gene expression, we simply asked whether and how SUMO may regulate cell plasticity, may behave as a kind of epigenetic barrier to cell fate transition. So to address this point, we started by looking at the extensively studied model of reprogramming from murine embryo fibroblast to induce pluripotent stem cells by expression of these four factors, the Yamanaka cocktail. And we found that the reprogramming process was significantly enhanced by decreasing the global level of simulation, either by knocking down the E2 enzyme or by treating the cells with a sumo chemical inhibitor. And here is the quantification. But leaving now sumo in the fibroblast to move to embryonic stem cells, we found that depleting sumulation not only strongly enhanced reprogramming to pluripotency, but it also dramatically enhanced the conversion back to totipotency, that is the two cell stage embryo which is characterized by re-expression of endogenous retroviruses and loss of OCT4 expression, and here is the quantification. So SUMO functions as a potent roadblock to reprogramming to both pluripotency and totipotency. And mechanistically, we could show that while in fibroblast, SUMO on chromatin is almost exclusively present on active enhances, as shown by these two active histone marks here. In contrast, in embryonic stem cell SUMO on chromatin is now almost exclusively present on silenced heterochromatin. And while in fibroblast SUMO marks enhances of the fibroblastic cell identity, in embryonic stem cells, SUMO now marks endogenous retroviruses in 70% of the cases. So in MEF, SUMO specifically marks enhances of the fibroblastic cell identity, while in pluripotent cells, SUMO marks silence retroposin in heterochromatin. And I had no time to show you but SUMO functions here to safeguard the integrity of the enhances, and it functions in embryonic stem cells to ensure the silencing of the retropoison. So to then assess whether SUMO may stabilize cell identity in a more general manner, we move now to direct cell conversion systems to transdifferentiation processes. And for that, we use two different systems. In the first one, pre-B cells are converted into macrophages by expression of this transcription factor. <coughs> so we treated pre-B cells 
with a sumo chemical inhibitor, and this markedly enhanced the expression of this macrophage-specific MAC1 marker with 100% of transdifferentiated cells after 36 hours, when 50% was still at the previous stage with the control. And in the other setting here, fibroblasts are converted into neurons by expression of these three transcription factors, and again, lowering the level of simulation significantly enhanced the number and the expression the number and the expression of these 2 to one positive cells, a marker specific for mature neuron. So, depleting simulation not only enhanced reprogramming to stemness, but it also facilitates cellular transdifferentiation. And going now another way, that is directed differentiation. We studied our favorite model of retinoic acid-induced differentiation of leukemic cells into um, mature granulocytes. And we found that treatment with a sumo inhibitor together with retinoic acid significantly enhanced the number of cells expressing this CD11B marker and showing these features, all hallmark of fully differentiated granulocytes. And interestingly, the sumo inhibitor alone was able to initiate granulocytic differentiation, although to a much lesser extent than when combined with retinic acid. So, uh, inhibition of simulation also favors terminal differentiation of the leukemic cell. So, altogether, this data indicate that in any direction you go, that is, reversion to pluripotency, to totipotency, transdifferentiation, or terminal differentiation, sumo functions as a general and key guardian of cell identity. So, in summary, sumo appears as a key safeguard mechanism for maintaining both pluripotent and somatic cell identities by resisting sulfate change. Mechanistically, while in fibroblasts, SUMO mainly functions from active enhancers to uh, safeguard the integrity of these enhancers, thus impeding reprogramming to pluripotency. In contrast, in pluripotent cells now, SUMO mainly functions from heterochromatin to maintain the levels required for the extension of the two-cell stage embryo transcriptional program, thus inhibiting the reversion back to totipotency. And together, these data indicate that transient chemical inhibition of simulation may be useful to facilitate sulfate change in clinical settings such as regenerative medicine and cancer treatment, and notably could be used to force terminal differentiation of the leukemic cells. And we are back to 30 years ago with APL and the concept of differentiation therapy of cancer. So I'd like now to thank um, the main collaborators inside and outside the lab who all contributed to write one of the chapters of the story I summarized today. Of course, uh, Laurent de Gauss and Duc de Té for the earlier work on APL, then uh, Stefan Müller, Angus Lamon, and Mike Matunis, among others, for the more recent insights on APL, all current members of the lab, and a special mention to Jack Kosek and Ilan Turia who carried out the work on sumo in cell identity. And let me stop by thanking again the Sherberg Foundation for their great support for uh, our future research. And I thank you all for your attention. <laughs>